and the executive director for New Winston Museum. May I see by a show of hands how many people are here for the first time? Wonderful, clearly the <laughs> side of the room. So. <laughs> <laughs> I care about all of you. Um, so welcome to the New Winston Museum. We've been in operation about 20 months now. So basically, you know, uh, an infant in the world of uh, an institution. We are trying to grow our programs by collaborating with organizations locally, such as the Moravian Music Foundation, to kind of help tell the story of um, Winston and St. coming together. Our mission is to preserve, promote, and present the dynamic history. Oh my gosh, I need to take a breath. <laughs> you need to learn how to sing. <laughs> the dynamic history and diverse stories of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, uh, the community, through education and collaboration. Uh, we are um, getting ready in March to unleash a new membership program. And so I'm going to ask a favor of y'all. After the program, I would love to collect not only your thoughts and feedback about the program, but your, your contact information so that we might keep in touch with you about future programs and also our new membership program. We really need our community to help support us in this endeavor because since we are such a fledgling institute, we're gonna ask people to invest their time to help us um, become a larger institution. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Chris Jordan, our Director of Education and Program to talk a little bit about this place. Oh. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming. I won't take too much of your time. I know we want to get to uh, the presentation. Uh, but the presentation today, uh, with the collaboration between the Moravian Music Foundation and ourselves, is um, a, a part of an exhibit we have going on right now that you see on the yellow-backed walls to your left in, in these units right here, called The War at Home. And it's a look at the, the effect of the Civil War, the, how the Civil War manifested itself here in Winston-Salem. It's a different viewpoint of the Civil War. Too often when we talk about wars, um, Civil War being one of the, the, the primary suspects, we often really look at politics and uh, military engagements and, <coughs> and the, the generals and soldiers, and we really tend to lose focus on how did this conflict affect average people, how did it affect communities that maybe didn't have battles in their own backyard or didn't have sieges or things like that. So when I was talking to folks about the Civil War in Winston-Salem, most people really have no idea what was going on here because we had no battles. So I decided to try to tell the story of what was going on here. And part of that story has to do with the Moravian bands that were coming out of uh, Salem and uh, Bethania and uh, were attached to, to regimental units around, around the state and in the Army of Northern Virginia. And that's what our um, speakers are, and our performers are going to be talking about today. So if you'd like to introduce them. Oh, sure. Well, I was going to tell you a little bit oh, uh, about our exhibit here. The, um, the, on the red walls, you see our uh, semi-permanent exhibit. It's called Every Picture Tells Our Story. And as you can see, they're numbered. <coughs> it's a kind of chronological uh, social history of the coming together of Winston and Salem and um, how we have really kind of circled back from becoming an industrial city, um, innovation, and now we are the city of arts and innovation. So uh, we're very pleased to, to tell that story. We have a timeline um, that offers some more precise history back there. And also, I welcome you to stick around uh, after the show, because we will turn everything on and enjoy the oral history project that we have that plays on three of the screens. We have about 40 interviews that we've conducted with people in the community. Unfortunately, we've already lost four of them. Most recently, um, is Kofi Haynes, who was just um, a wonderful member of our community. Frank Haynes, John Medlin, and a very important member of the civil rights community, Jar Dr. Jerry Drayton. What we're trying to do is collect these oral histories so that we can have um, you know, documented facts that aren't in books, or that will become parts of books yet to be written. So um, it's an ongoing endeavor for us, and if you know somebody that you'd like to nominate to have be interviewed, please do either contact myself or Chris, and, and we'll talk. Um, without further ado, though, I, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, a lifelong resident of Winston-Salem and a North Carolina Moravian, Nola Canals is a graduate of Wake Forest University, 
and earned both an MA and a PhD in music theory from the Eastman School of um, Music in Rochester, New York. After teaching for a number of years, she joined the Moravian Music Foundation staff as director of research and programs in 1992 and was appointed director two years later. Um, Philip, there you are. You're hiding from me. Um, uh, flutist, uh, flautist Philip Dunnigan studied at Juilliard and had a very successful performance career in New York. Um, for 37 years, he served as a faculty member at UNCSA as a professor of flute and chamber music. He played with the Winston-Salem Symphony for 25 years and is currently a volunteer research advisor with the Moravian Music Foundation. His research is primarily into the music of the Civil War era. And Glenn Sieber, with us, uh, has appeared in many of the world's most acclaimed orchestras, opera companies, and festivals, including the New York Philharmonic, the Boston Symphony, the Cleveland Orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra, and many more. He has been on the voice faculty at the uh, UNCSA since 1991. Since 2004, he's been the director of the Magnolia Baroque Festival, and in 2011, the director of the historic, uh, he's the music director at the historic Homer Radio Church in Old Salem. So thank you all for being here, and Phil. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say one thing before I start, and that is uh, a flautist is a very wealthy English gentleman who plays a little flute. <laughs> <laughs> Except they pronounce it flautist. <laughs> I'm a flute player. <laughs> <laughs> Only a flute player. Um, late on the night of April 10th, 1865, after the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, Private Thomas Pollock Devereux II, a courier for Major General Brian Grimes, was sent to General Lee's tent in order to collect the last batch of paroles. When he arrived, a band was playing a farewell song for the general. He emerged presently, teary-eyed, and thanked the musicians. The song they played was, When the Swallows Homeward Fly, and the band was that of the 4th Regiment North Carolina Troops, led by Sergeant Edward B. Neve, the chief musician and younger brother of the distinguished Confederate musician William H. Neve. The song they played was Agta, composed <clears throat> by Franz Abt to a poem by Carl Harrelson. Agta in America was universally popular in its English language translation titled When the Swallows Homeward Fly, or Parting is pain. Unprotected by a U.S. copyright, it was issued by every American publisher. A copy of this song could probably be found in the piano bench of every American home. <laughs> Likewise, every band in the Confederate Army needed an arrangement of it. The research materials pertaining to the performance today <coughs> were provided to the Moravian Music Foundation by Dr. Robert Downing, the founder and leader of the reconstituted band of the 11th Regiment North Carolina Troops. When these materials arrived, we examined our holdings for copies of the song from the Civil War era. We found three. First, a bilingual version published in 1851 by George Willick in Baltimore. Second, a handwritten copy in the music manuscript book of Miss Sue Phillips, a student at the Salem Academy. Her book was dated 1862, and her copy appears to have been made from the Willig edition, using only the English translation. Third, we found an arrangement made for the 26th Regiment Band by its baritone player and artist, Alexander Mino who added an elaborate obligato part for his own instrument. <laughs> by, by the way, uh, he lived most of his life about a block away from where we are right now. Um, the words you will hear today were written for this melody shortly after the war by Catherine Ann Devereux Edmonston, the wife of the planter Patrick Edmonston, and the older sister of Private Devereux. 
She has been described as a person of keen mind, penetrating intelligence, and an excellent chess player. <laughs> Her Civil War diaries are a valuable source to historians studying women's experiences at the time. Most notably of these histories is probably Dr. Drew Gilpin Faust's classic study, Mothers of Invention. Has anybody read that book? Yay! <laughs> it's a great book. She's the, uh, she's the president of uh, Yale now. The words which she composed for Ops Melody were inspired by her brother's description to her of the last music played for General Lee by the 4th Regiment Band on the night of April the 10th, 1865. Dr. Nola Reed Knauss created and titled the edition that we shall hear today. After over 100 years, Mrs. Edmonston's words and Op's melody are at last married in print. <laughs> Officiating at the ceremony will be Glenn Siebert, music director of Home Moravian Church, and the Reverend Dr. Nola Reed Knauss. <laughs> now the battle din is o'er, shot and shot. Thank you. 
just looking at it and reading about it and then hearing it. What an experience. I got a little chill from that, to tell you the truth. Um, the Moravian communities of Salem, Bethania, and Bethabara in North Carolina contributed three bands to the Confederate Army. They were the bands of the 26th and 33rd Regiments North Carolina troops and the band of the 1st Battalion North Carolina sharpshooters. Two of these bands have been subjects of studies by distinguished historians. A Johnny Reb Band from Salem chronicles the history of the 26th Regiment Band, and Lee Sherrill's Kirkland's Confederate Band, that of the 1st Battalion. Um, unfortunately, Harry Hall has been deceased for a long time, but Lee Sherrill is with us today. Julius Leinbach, 2nd B-flat cornetist in the 26th Regiment Band, described in his war memoir, the last music performed by the band on April the 1st, 1865, during the fighting retreat from Petersburg, Virginia, in these words. After we had gone a few miles and seemed to have gotten away from everybody else, we came to a house where the good lady gave us some bread and meat, for which we returned our acknowledgments by playing Lorena thereby ending our career as the 26th North Carolina Regimental Band. <coughs> By the next day, April the 2nd, the band members became separated in the general confusion of the retreat. Some entered into captivity, while others simply began walking home to Salem. Lorena was undoubtedly the most popular love song of the Confederate Army. Diarist Mary Chestnut had this to say about the song. By 1861, there was a girl in large hoops and calico frock at every piano between Charleston and the Mississippi <laughs> banging out Lorena <laughs> by an out-of-tune thing and looking up into a man's face who wears the Confederate uniform. <laughs> Lorena's author, the Reverend Henry D. L. Webster, a Universalist minister in Zanesville, Ohio, composed the poem in commemoration of his thwarted romance with Eleanor Bloxham, a girl in the choir. Brokenhearted, he left Zanesville for a pulpit in Warren, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, he wrote the words, the poem for this song. Some years later, he met J.P. Webster, no relation, who set his poem to music. Published in Chicago, it soon became an enormous success and went on to become an American classic. The name Lorena was invented by Webster by simply transposing the letters of his lost love's name, Eleanor, into Lorena. <laughs> Reverend Philbrick, now recovered from his heartbreak, went on to be a successful songwriter whose hits included Paul Vane or Lorena's Reply and In the Sweet By and By. <laughs> Eleanor Bloxon also recovered and married a future Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. If this melody sounds familiar, it is likely that you have heard it as background music in Civil War era movies such as The Searchers, starring John Wayne, where it never stops from beginning to end. <laughs> in Gone with the Wind, Rhett Butler, on hearing this melody, turns to Scarlett O'Hara and asks her the name of the song being played. And she replies, Oh, it's just something we captured from the Yankees. <laughs>
uh, that's the show, but I wanted to tell you that in the back, we are, are showing uh, reproductions of the music that you uh, have just heard in the different copies and the, and the different arrangements. So you can take a look at them. Uh, was there anything anybody wants to ask or talk about or anything? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Philip, I was wondering if maybe you uh, could take a second and just explain maybe some of the people here might not be familiar with really the role that the, the band members played in relation to the troops and uh, what they actually did on an everyday basis besides playing. Uh, maybe just provide some context there. All right. The first thing they did uh, was to not carry a weapon, which was in everybody's mind from, that came from this area. Um, there, there, there weren't a lot of enthusiasts uh, for the war here, which, unless there was money to be made. Um, what bandsmen did, there were, there were two kinds. There were, there were field musicians. A musician is not a bandsman. Uh, a musician plays a drum or a fife, and he is with companies. Uh, each company was entitled to have a drummer and a fife. But a band was usually a, uh, a regimental band, even though the ones that started here started as a small outfit coming from um, local companies. The, um, their duties were, of course, playing on the march, uh, playing reveille in the morning, playing reviews, playing serenades. If an officer wanted to go courting, he would simply take the band along. <laughs> and uh, probably the most, uh, they also played in the trenches uh, in Petersburg, and they played on the field of battle. At, uh, at Gettysburg until the uh, Northern uh, Artillery found their range. Um, they also, uh, probably the most dramatic thing they did was work in the hospitals. Their job was uh, to be, um, they, they assisted in everything that went on. And what they saw, and you, you can imagine what went on in a, in a hospital after a a battle where there's uh, not enough of anything to take care of them, and all we, all we can do is just jump off limbs and things. And, and so uh, they were pretty. They really, uh, they really served, uh, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's been really great coming. <laughs> If you have an email address, that would actually work, it, that you yeah. actually checked. That probably works best for us, too. So on the back, you should put your name, email address, and uh, phone number, any other contact information you're comfortable with. I check. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, oh, I want to talk a little bit about some upcoming programs that we have as well. Um, did you want to talk about some of the Civil War ones and then all oh, the Oh, sure. And the so um, this exhibit that we have going on right now, the War at Home, will be up through the end of June. And uh, we have several programs like this one uh, that are in cor corresponding to it that will be going on through that time. Uh, next month, at March 11th, we have a local scholar uh, named Phyllis Hoots, who's a genealogist and local scholar, who really did a lot of research into unionism and secret society activity going on during the war. As uh, Philip mentioned, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm, especially for fighting in the war. And beyond that, there was not a, locally, in both Winston and Salem, and Forsyth County in general, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for uh, secession or the war in general. So there was a fair amount of unionism and some secret societies and things like that going on that were uh, uh, pushed down. They weren't 
widely publicized in the press, so it's hard to find much information about it. So she's going to present information on that. And then in April, we have uh, a scholar going to be presenting on the, the North Carolina Civil War monument. So all, uh, there's over 100 um, Civil War monuments throughout North Carolina. And besides just giving a survey of those, he's going to be talking about how the, uh, those monuments developed over time, how in the years right after the war, there were certain types of monuments, and years later, how uh, they were constructed differently, the th themes may have changed, and um, who was uh, honored changed over time. So that should be an interesting one. And then lastly, uh, in June, uh, one of our uh, guests here, uh, Johnny uh, Pearson, is going to be presenting on Dr. John Francis Schaffner, who is a local uh, surgeon from Salem, um, a Moravian surgeon who uh, served with many companies during the war. And uh, you may recognize the name Schaffner, but uh, that's, uh, he's one of the, probably the, the patriarch of that, of that family. So uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Um, Sure, that sounds great. And also next week, we welcome you back on Thursday at noon uh, for a, our salon series discussion, which will be with um, a panelist of uh, three local arts leaders. Uh, we've got Allison Perkins from uh, Rinalda House Museum of Art, uh, Museum and Art. Um, and we've got, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my list in front of me. We've got... Um, Oh, help yeah. me. I yeah. just went Corey with Madden, with, Corey the, Madden from with the UNCSA, it's at Keenan Institute, and we have Mark Leach of SICA. And they're going to be um, all, we're inviting them together to be moderated by a board member and also a guest here today, uh, uh, Mike Wakeford, a history um, professor at UNCSA. And really, the, the idea is that to give the public a chance to, to ask questions and give them a chance to, to talk about some of the challenges and, and, and um, opportunities that local arts institutions are facing in the 21st century. Right, so by signing up for our newsletter, you'll certainly be in the know on future programs coming up. So I'm going to pass this around for anyone who wants to be part of the raffle. It's a really good one. <laughs>